Hi, thank you so much, Deborah. It's, it's fantastic for me to be here at the Brooklyn Historical Society under any circumstance, um, but particularly with my good friend Drew Faust um, working on the film based on her book, This Republic of Suffering, was really a revelation for me, um, having worked 20 years earlier on a 12-hour film with Ken about the Civil War. It was stunning to revisit some of the same territory under completely new auspices. Um, somebody asked me tonight just before, you know, since working on the Civil War series, you know, what, what new scholarship had come out? And I have to say that Drew's book, This Republic of Suffering, not only is one of the 10 great best books of 2008, it's really one of the best books about the American Civil War ever written. Um, and so for those of you who know it, you already know what I'm saying is the case. But for those of you who don't, it's really an amazing revisiting of the central fact of the Civil War, the staggering death toll, and a consideration of how those trans the transformation of that reality continues to resonate in American culture today. So in addition to sort of talking with Drew and asking her questions about that book and her work and her thoughts about the Civil War and its continuing relevance, we're going to show the opening four or five minutes of the film um, which features a stunning letter which Drew found uh, in the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond as part of her research. Then we'll talk for a while, Drew will talk for a while, and we'll show uh, another longer clip which is about Gettysburg, which is really the pivot point in so many ways um, of the war and of Drew's thinking, I think, about some of the circumstances of the war. Talk a little more and then we will be as disciplined as, as possible to leave open as much time for you to ask questions and um, make comments and, and be part of the conversation. So without further ado, let's show Will the first four or five minute clip and then Drew and I will come up and begin to talk. Evening of May 10th, 1864, as the Civil War ground on into its fourth straight year, 26-year-old James Robert Montgomery, a private in the Confederate Signal Corps in Virginia, wrote a letter to his father back home in Camden, Mississippi, dripping blood on the paper as he wrote from the horrific shoulder wound he had sustained a few hours earlier. Dear Father, this is my last letter to you. I have been struck by a piece of shell and my right shoulder is horribly mangled. And I know death is inevitable. I am very weak, but I write to you because I know you would be delighted to read a word from your dying son. I know death is near, that I will die far from home and friends of my early youth. But I have friends here, too, who are kind to me. My friend Fairfax will write you at my request and give you the particulars of my death. My grave will be marked so that you may visit it if you desire to do so. It is optionary with you whether you let my remains rest here or in Mississippi. I would like to rest in the graveyard with my dear mother and brothers, but it's a matter of minor importance. Give my love to all my friends. My strength fails me. My horse and my equipments will be left for you. Again, a long farewell to you. May we meet in heaven. Your dying son, J.R. Montgomery. James Montgomery's friend, Fairfax, did write soon thereafter, forwarding some of his effects and assuring his father that he had been conscious to the end and that he had died at peace with himself and his maker. But it was little consolation. <laughs> 
Though the grave had been marked, the family was never able to find it and were thus never able to realize their fond hope of bringing their dead son home. south or north, ours all. Our young men, once so handsome and so joyous, taken from us. The son from the mother, the husband from the wife, the dear friend from the dear friend. And everywhere among these countless graves, we see and ages yet may see on monuments and gravestones, singly or in masses, to thousands or tens of thousands, the significant word, unknown. Walt Whitman, 1865. You know, I, 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 see, I, I look at that letter, you know, that we filmed in the archive where you found it um, in, in Richmond, and it, it, it so summarizes, so embodies, it, it would be a better way of putting it, so much of what you were doing in this Republic of Suffering, um, the study of the impact of the death tolls in the Civil War. I was just wondering, in the most basic way, and I also would love to have you explain for those who don't necessarily know just what, how staggering mm -hmm. that death toll was um, and what wasn't in place in America to deal with that kind of death on that kind of scale and how transforming it was. But for you as a historian, what it was to come across a letter like that, to hold it in your hand, stained with James's blood, um, and where that kind of took you in this kind of extraordinary moment in your own career. Thanks for that question, Rick. I, I have to say, every time I see this opening to the film, I just am overwhelmed once again with the magnitude of the tragedy that the Civil War was. What sent me to that question was an earlier book I wrote about women in the Civil War South. And as I read their diaries and letters, they talk constantly about death. And I thought, we as historians of the Civil War really haven't attended to that issue. We write about very important things. We write about saving the nation. We write about emancipation. We write about leadership, the nation state. But no one had really explored what it means to lose such a substantial part of the population. Now, when I wrote this book, and if you have read the book or do read the book, you'll find that I used a figure of 620,000 dead, which was the estimate at that time, 2008, when I finished the book. Since then, new, more sophisticated demographic analysis suggests that it was more like 750,000 people. That would be the equivalent as a percentage of the population of about 7 million Americans today. When you think about how we react to several thousand deaths in Afghanistan or Iraq, Think about what this society would be feeling, perceiving, doing if we had lost seven million of our citizens in a war. So when I thought about that, I decided I needed to ask some basic questions, like just what did they do with the bodies? Logistically, how do you respond to such an unexpected death toll? How did people mourn? How did people explain this death toll in terms of religion? As one Southern poet said, how does God have the heart to allow it? What does it make you have to think or ask about a divine being if you see such tragedy all around you? And then what does it mean about the nation state when people have paid that kind of price to sustain it 
what does that mean the nation then owes to its citizens? So those were the questions that brought me to this, to this project. And this letter was one that summarized so much of it. it. The word, I don't know if you, if it struck you, but when he says, you will be delighted to get this letter from your dying son, it's like, what? Why delight? It would, was because it was far better to hear from your son that he had died, that he was in hands of friends, that he was gonna be buried decently, and where it was, the, James Montgomery anticipated his parents would be able, to, I mean, his father would be able to find his grave, than to be one of the unknown, as Whitman's poem points out. The nation was so unprepared for this level of death, soldiers didn't wear dog tags, they didn't have identity uh, on them, so there were not ways of identifying hundreds of thousands of bodies. There were no regular burial units. There was no system of notification of next of kin. And one of the aspects I discovered as I began exploring this topic was all the inventiveness, improvisation that soldiers and civilians alike introduced to try to overcome those deficiencies. Um, soldiers who were comrades would write usually, and say, I saw your son die, he's buried here, or he wasn't buried at all, but he had a good death. So just all kinds of ways that this society tried to respond to the inadequacies of preparation for this kind of death toll. And then ultimately, maybe we'll talk a little bit about this later, um, after the war, there was an enormous reburial movement that was sponsored by the federal government and became the origin of the national cemetery system. A commitment to the dead, a responsibility assumed by the nation state that never had occurred to the nation beforehand. So the way Americans thought about death, the ways they dealt with death, were changed profoundly by this death toll and by the experience of civil war. And I think a lot of it is captured just in the way the death is reported by James Montgomery, what he wants his father to hear and understand, and then Whitman summing up the enormous numbers of unknown. Probably half the Civil War dead were buried unknown. What I was so struck by, Drew, was, you know, the fact that this is a letter written in the spring of 1864. It's not the first battle. It's not mm -hmm. the first year of the war. But the war has now gone on, ground on through three years already. Mm -hmm. And that the clear expectation is, as you point out, that there will be nobody. There is no burial unit. There is no system for notifying James Montgomery's father. He is self-notifying. Mm -hmm. He's writing his mm -hmm. own obituary. He's you know, arranging for his own burial detail through friends yep. who happen to be in the army, but nevertheless, it's his friend Fairfax mm -hmm. who's going to be notifying. And that, that it had to be improvised, as you point out, is so striking that even three years into the war, South and North, maybe particularly in the South, are still staggered by the work. Give us a sense of, compared to previous American wars, from the Revolution, the War of 1812, to the Mexican War, it wasn't as if people didn't care about burying their dead. Of course they cared about burying their dead. No one could possibly have been prepared for slaughter on the scale that the Civil War introduced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the scale of it was part of the reason for the complete inadequacy of systems and responses. There were about three million men under arms in the Civil War, about 880,000 uh, Southerners and the rest over two million Northerners. This was an army of a size that was completely unprecedented. The American Revolution, there were probably never more than 30,000 men under arms. And so when you think about the difference in scale, you can see some of the reasons why the informality or lack of system just led to a complete breakdown of procedure in a, in a situation um, like the one of, of James Montgomery. Uh, in the Mexican War, the dead, um, I actually visited this, I don't know if I've even told you this, in Mexico City, right, there is a little tiny American cemetery with a monument that was erected to honor 750 Mexican War dead who were assembled, their bodies were brought to this place in Mexico City at the end of the war. Not one of them is identified. And so the involvement of the nation state, the United States, was simply to erect this obelisk at, um, after the conflict. 
And it wasn't assumed that the state had an obligation. And when we think now, you know, bring everyone home, the obligation to the dead, the obligation of identifying the very careful arrangements of wearing two dog tags, one of which can be taken off you, none of that had been developed. But more profoundly, it was a whole different understanding of what the country owed. And I think a lot of this came out of what the Civil War was fought for. If we are, said one writer um, at the end of the war in Harper's Magazine, if we're to see ourselves fighting for the rights of democratic citizens, we owe things to our nation state, but our nation state also owes things for, to us. And so part of what happened in the Civil War was a changed understanding of what a nation is because of what everyone had sacrificed for it. When you give this much to the country, then the country owes you certain things. The national cemetery system was one of them. The pension system after the war was also new. <clears throat> and these were activities by the national government at a scale that had never existed before and was consonant, I think, with the scale of the war itself. You know, one of the things that <clears throat> your book is arranged in such an interesting way through a series of present participles or gerunds Killing, dying, burying, accounting, enumerating, remembering, honoring. I'm sure I haven't gotten them all right, but you're all this good. sort of, um, and it begins with the business end and then moves to how you deal with the bodies. And one thing that was very, very profound about your book was the, uh, you, you cite a statistic um, both in the book and in, in the film version of your book, the, the number of, pe of the religiosity of America in the mid 19th century after the, you know, the various religious revivals and the Second Great Awakening that 98% you know, of Americans were professed Christians. And as you m point out, more people went to church every Sunday than voted in the election of 1860. Give us a sense of in that extremely religious world, what a good death was and what an extraordinary assault the reality mm -hmm. of the Civil War mm -hmm. turned out to be on what this powerful, deeply held sense of what the best and right way was to die. And this, Rick, is also tied up very deeply with the whole Victorian culture out of which the um, Civil War emerged. Assum assumptions that a death should be at home you should die with relatives around you so that they could hear any last words because those last words might give them a hint about what your eternal fate would be. They would be determinative in some way and revealing of your eternal fate. You should show that you were prepared to die and you were willing to die. That meant you were more likely to be ready to meet your maker and your maker would be ready to meet you. So deaths were scrutinized so that um, family members could be reassured that the dying person was likely to be uh, in heaven where they could be reunited with him or her after their own deaths. So these good deaths were rituals, uh, bedside rituals often, um, that were extremely important as punctuation marks at the end of a life and also uh, pathways into an eternal life. And when people died away from home, those kinds of consolations and certainties could not be offered. Um, in uh, mid 19th century America, probably about 15% of people died away from home. In the Civil War, of course, all these people died away from home. So just disrupting that relationship was, was profound. And what I found was there were often letters like the one Montgomery wrote, two family members, either from a dying person or from someone who was with a dying person, trying to say that this individual went through all the stages that you might have expected if that person were home with you, dying at home. Said he was willing to meet his maker, said he was prepared to die, sent these words of consolation to you. There are a number of Walt Whitman letters, for example. You, you may know that Walt Whitman spent a lot of time as a hospital visitor during the war. A lot of what he did was write letters to the bereaved, describing deaths, to reassure those family members that these deaths had, in fact, been good deaths. So the effort to create the situation of a good death in a condition that was so 
alien to a good death was part of the effort both of civilians and nurses, doctors, others who spent time with dying soldiers to try to reduce the nature of that rupture and persist with the elements that were seen to, to constitute a good death. You know, the, um, the transfer, which your book charts so movingly, um, of the, the death and the administration, so to speak, of the rights of death were very much the preserve of the family and the clan. It was not the mm -hmm. preserve of anything larger than the immediate community. Mm -hmm. And that the circumstances of death in the Civil War made that impossible except by these sort of improvised means mm -hmm. to say, we did what you would have wanted us to do had mm -hmm. you been, or you yourself would have wanted you to do had you been able to be here when your son or brother or father died. And we had a, you know, a chance to speak <clears throat> in the course of making the film with an extraordinary man. Um, Thomas Lynch, a poet and an undertaker from, from Michigan, whose work many here might be um, familiar with. And Thomas Lynch mentioned that, you know, to have a good funeral, and this is somebody who's dealing with this today as an undertaker, he said, and since time in memoriam, you've needed four things. You need a corpse, you need mourners, you need, as Lynch put it, somebody to say a few words that say in one way or another, behold, I show you a mystery to say that we're now confronting something which is at the very limits of human experience, and however you want to interpret that, we are going to consecrate this limit experience by saying something. And then you need transport. You need to move the body. The body has to be taken from the floor or the bed, some place that the family or the community thinks is the appropriate place, and you know it, and you watch it, and the mourners go with the body and they put it into the ground or into the fire or into the tree or wherever it goes and somehow that consecrates this passage for people and that the Civil War absolutely made it possible for all the people who had skin in that game to participate. Mm -hmm. So how is it going to happen? And it seems to me that the first part of your book, the first half of your book, up through, up to Gettysburg, really is charting a nation, trying to do everything it can in a funny way, on the one hand to take care of them, to, to deal, with, manage the material reality of death, but to not quite understand that there may well need to be larger governmental and institutional structures put in place to deal with it. And that the turning point of the war, in some sense, between 1862, sometime between Antietam, September 19th, 1862, and three extraordinary days in July of 1863 at Gettysburg. The country kind of is led by that experience of death to realize somebody's going to have to do something about the corpses, the mourners, the words that are spoken over the grave, and the transport of the bodies. Give us a sense of the war in that sort of that, that incredibly traumatizing two years up to Getty, mm -hmm. the Battle of Gettysburg, and then maybe we'll mm -hmm. show okay. the other clip, which is the aftermath mm -hmm. of Gettysburg. Just a couple of aspects of that. Um, the Battle of Bill Run, the first real battle of the war in the summer of 1861, there are estimated 900 dead. At Gettysburg in the summer of 1863, two years later, 7,000 dead and 50,000 wounded. And Soldiers write and say, you know, we thought Bull Run was horrible. We thought this is just an unthinkable level of death. But multiply it almost, what, nine times, and it becomes unimaginable. It's such a profound uh, experience. And as so many of these dead are either away from home or unknown, people start performing these rituals for individuals who aren't their family members. They become substitutes or surrogates. Soldiers look desperately for rags or some kind of cloth to wrap a fellow soldier in so that he won't be a coffin's out of the question, but could they just find a shroud so he won't be buried in the, in the bare earth? This gets tied up with people's sense of their own humanity. And many animal uh, metaphors, we don't want to be buried like dogs, we don't want to be buried like chickens, we want to be human beings. And so that taking care of one another outside the family emerges as a part of the improvisation. And I think, Rick, that leads to the language of Whitman, our dead, 
these become the nation's dead. They become collectively owned right, not, in not a sense. A family's dead or, yeah. a, or even a state's dead. Mm -hmm. And they also take on enormous symbolism uh, as the cost of the war and something that must be reckoned as the purposes of the war continue to be defined. And of course the Gettysburg Address articulates that in such an extraordinary way. You know, your book um, it so is sort of resoundingly transformed my sense of, of, of the kind of the war scene as a kind of a huge narrative. And that period from the summer of 1862, when the Union had lost essentially every battle um, and was going to drive on to the, at best, Pyrrhic victory, which was Antietam mm -hmm. in the fall. Enough of a victory so that Lincoln could do the one thing as a military instrument he knew was necessary because the number of dead had reached such a huge magnitude that there were people no longer signing up for the war, that there weren't enough, there weren't enough live bodies in the North to take care of the war effort. Mm -hmm and you needed to somehow be able to expand it, and that the Pyrrhic victory at Antietam allowed him to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Because as a war effort, the Union now needed living black bodies mm -hmm. to substitute or, or replace and act as surrogates for so many dead white bodies at that point. Mm -hmm. So that you see almost step by step, with extraordinary clarity in your work, how the experience of death led, at least one can see in retrospect, to a series of decisions. No one thought when the war was over that you were going to have to have um, a national cemetery at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. No one thought you were going to have to have that kind of, um, that kind of, the magnitude of that kind of sort of collective state effort to do it. No one thought you would have to have something like the words spoken at Gettysburg. So perhaps let's see this last 10 minute scene, which kind of charts that time from the day after Gettys the battle ended on July 4th, 1863, down through the consecration of the grave. Good. Will? Gettysburg, it's in the North, so it brings the North into the war in a way that it hadn't been. Many people in the North could escape the direct effects of the war in a way not much of the South was able to do. So in a sense, Gettysburg makes it a national war in its impact on civilian societies. It's the scale of that battle also. 7,000 dead. 22,000 wounded being cared for in a town that had about, what, 2,400 inhabitants. How could they take care of these dead and wounded? As Robert E. Lee and the badly battered Army of Northern Virginia retreated southward from Pennsylvania, ending the second and final Confederate invasion of the North, 7,000 slain men and 3,000 dead horses lay strewn across the field in the summer heat. In three days, Union and Confederate forces had suffered almost as many casualties as in all previous American wars combined. Once again, the work of burying thousands upon thousands of dead fell to the Union forces who held the devastated battleground and to the stunned citizens of Gettysburg itself, who were implored to help the beleaguered Union soldiers, overwhelmed by the magnitude of the task before them. The mass burials proceeded in the summer heat. Confederates were buried in trenches containing 150 or more men. The decomposing bodies often hurled rather than laid to rest. Sometimes the rotting bodies ruptured compelling burial parties to work elsewhere until the stench had dissipated. Two soldiers from Maine received permission to return to the torn and shattered field and search for any sign of a close friend they had last seen on the third day of battle. 
We found him face down, and with many others, the flesh eaten in that hot climate by maggots, but not so bad but that we could recognize him. When we went to bury him, all we could find to dig a grave was an old hoe in a small building. The bottom of the grave was covered with empty knapsacks. We laid in our beloved brother and covered him with another knapsack and overall put as much earth as we could find. We found a piece of hardwood box cover and cut his name on it with a jackknife and nailed it to the tree at the head of his grave. The battle in July and people were still putting peppermint oil on their faces when frost comes in the fall because the stench of the dead bodies is still in the air. So months after the battle, that miasma of death and loss and decay is hanging over that town. How could people live through that and not be transformed? Something new in the American experience would now begin to arise from the fields of Gettysburg, as in the days, weeks, and months following the battle. The tiny Pennsylvania town now became the setting for one of the greatest collective efforts to honor the dead in the history of the Republic. Though no formal policy or appropriation for burying the dead would emerge during the war itself, the year before, Congress had passed measures giving the President and the War Department the power to purchase land near battlefields, as circumstance and public health concerns dictated, often adjacent to the overflowing military hospitals. But the burial ground that now began to take shape south of Gettysburg, one of five federal military cemeteries created during the war for the dead of a particular battle would go far beyond the practical needs of disposing of dead bodies. Not long after the battle, with financial help from every state in the Union that had lost men in the engagement, a local lawyer named David Wills oversaw the purchase of 17 acres in the town, which was soon taken over by the federal government. In October, contracts were let for the reburial of Union soldiers on the new ground at the rate of $1.59 for each body. One month later, in November 1863, a host of dignitaries from Boston, Philadelphia, and Washington, including President Lincoln himself, journeyed to Gettysburg to dedicate the new Soldiers National Cemetery there. Lincoln's brief but soaring remarks, like the new burial ground itself, with its rows of identical graves, radiating symmetrically and democratically around the cemetery's central focus, marked a seismic shift in governmental attitude and policy towards the dead. One that said that the dead were no longer simply the responsibility of their families, that they and their loss and their meaning belong to the nation. The Gettysburg Address is a statement about finding the redemption in the dead. But we need to remember that in that cemetery that day, half those coffins weren't even buried yet. Graves were still open. This was a, a place of death, mass death, where Lincoln tried to craft this statement of, so uh, what does it mean? It is a kind of elegiac statement that if this war has purpose, if all these dead have died for something meaningful, then it means we are going to redefine this country. In effect, the Gettysburg Address is saying the First Republic just died here. It's being buried in those graves. We together now have to rebuild it. We have to remake it. We have to win this war first and then remake it. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation 
conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. If you imagine that there's a continuing relationship between the living and the dead, that even though we're doing the acting, the dead continue to be in our thoughts, and there's almost a kind of dialogue between the living and the dead that continues. In some sense, that dialogue requires that we make them speak. We make them mean something. We make them carry forward. We make them enter conversations that they had no part of. We make them do political work that they didn't do or couldn't do themselves. And I think that's one of the things that's going on in the Gettysburg Address, is the dead are being harnessed. They're being conscripted to a national political project that's going to carry forward in some other way. What the war does is take notions of immortality that had been previously located in heaven, in some afterworld, you know, you'll be reconstituted, and shift that sort of eternal frame to the state, and that your eternity your lasting contribution will be to the body politic and to the nation now. That this new birth of freedom in America is based on the sacrifice and literally the martyrdom of American troops. That those deaths are redemptive and they, and they serve a theological purpose, but now they serve a political and civic end too. They are literally rebuilding, remaking, reconstituting the American civic order. The words of the Gettysburg Address define the nation as the product of these deaths. When we think about what the Civil War means to us, it's in no small part because of that linking, explicitly by Lincoln, of our national identity with those who gave their lives from these honored dead. You know, those 269 words, you know, Drew, I have to say, among the revelations was how the sense that I had, and I think anybody has, of what those words mean was transformed through the lens of this Republic of Suffering. I mean, I, we, Sam Waterston read the same words in a 12-hour film that my brother Ken and I worked on, and that came out in 1990, and James Cromwell here read them the same words, um, and I have to say I was stunned by uh, 
the transformed sense of their meaning through the lens of your book um, and how much, in a sense, this moment, 1863, gathered the meaning of the dead to date. And when you see, you know, the next thing that was to happen was a Grant comes east, takes command at Lincoln's behest of the entire Union Army, resurrecting the general, lieutenant general rank, which hadn't existed since George Washington. And it's rather as if Lincoln mustered the will to understand what his own words meant, and that there was going to have to be an acceptance of death. And then you look at the stunning statistic that the number who had died by the time those bodies were being put into the ground at Gettysburg was only half. So in the next year plus, until that the war ended, again. that many more died again. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about, here we are, you know, there was a five year, four year sesquicentennial um, that began five years ago and ended last April um, with the 150th anniversary of Appomattox. What your book makes very clear was that the war was not over when Lee surrendered to Grant or when Sherman did the mopping up work in the Carolinas after that, that it was not May 1865. Give us a sense of how, once the war had been won, the reality of what the living now had to contend with went on for months and years after mm -hmm. that, so that here we are in 2016, it's the sesquicentennial now of an extraordinary series of events that took place, though the gunfire had stopped, the war was still going on. One of the <clears throat> insights that this project brought to me about American history, which I'd studied my whole life and had practiced professionally for decades before I did this book, was I now think entirely differently about the late 19th century. Because this was a population of people, almost all of whom were connected to someone whose fate remained unknown. And if we think about how terrible it is not to know the fate of a loved one and how much effort we put today to bringing home all the dead from our previous wars, 750,000 dead, probably less than half of them, the records are so incomplete we don't exactly know, but less than half of them identified. That means people like the ones whose stories I read, thinking every time the door opened, maybe that was your long lost son who somehow had just been delayed or in a mental hospital or wherever he was. These, we use the word closure. There was no closure for hundreds of thousands of Americans. How did that affect how they saw the world, how they lived their lives for the rest of those lives well after the war was over? So that's one of the ways I've thought about the implications and, and meaning of this. But I also was fascinated to discover something I hadn't known anything about, and I think when you did the first Civil War film, Nothing, you didn't know yeah. about it either, which was the reburial <laughs> movement. Uh, began in 1866, continued at full pace really until 1871, and resulted in 74 national cemeteries. Um, details of soldiers who had not yet been released from their military service, many of them African American, scoured the South looking for every body they could find of a Union soldier, prompted in part by uh, reports of desecration of Union bodies by Southerners angry about their defeat. Extraordinary efforts to identify as many of these bodies that were reburied in the national cemeteries. 303,000 bodies were located and reburied. Think of the scale of that, finding all those individuals and reburying them in the national cemeteries. And um, over 50% of those soldiers were identified through the most extraordinary detective work, representing a project that was a national project, a political project, but a project of dedication and sentiment and love and religion that was quite an extraordinary testimony to the insistence on humanity that accompanied the sense that you have to treat the dead with respect. Get the body back. Get the body back, right. treat them as if they're humans, not dead chickens or dogs or all the other kinds of words that, that I so often found used. And so this was an extraordinary project. 
But many of you, or at least some of you may be thinking, she's talking about the North. What about the South? What happened there? There was no um, inclusion of Confederate soldiers in this national project, um, but there was improvisation on the part of Southerners, particularly led by women, white women, who tried to uh, create organizations around their churches or in communities to find Southern dead in the battlefields in, around Richmond, around other areas of intense conflict, and rebury them in a private way without the aid of the national government. This created a lot of resentment on the part of white Southerners as they would see the Northern burial effort come and, and pick up a Northern soldier and leave the Southern soldier lying there. Uh, and a lot of the ceremonies that surrounded the Southern reburial effort were really the beginnings of a kind of neo-Confederate lost cause um, rituals and, and engagements and, and rhetoric. And so I think that they sharpened the divisions between North and South after the war. But just to give you an example of the scale in the South, near Petersburg, Virginia, I'm looking at someone from Richmond as I say this, near Petersburg, Virginia, a cemetery called Blandford uh, houses uh, 30,000 dead Southern soldiers. And Petersburg itself, the population before the war was only 18,000. So this was a pretty extraordinary effort on the part of civilians. It did not amount to the 300,000 across the South that the North did, but this was a long an effort and a dedicated effort that really changed our whole national approach to war dead by creating the National Cemetery System. Talk a little bit about um, one of the one of the Union officers in particular who you followed, uh, Edwin, Edmund Whitman, who who really. Um, it is this, the discoveries that he made in coming down to the middle middle ground of Tennessee and Kentucky. Talk a little bit about what he found and the impact that okay. his work I'll, had. I'll tell this story, and then I think we should see if there are questions. Mm -hmm. But this is a great story to stop on, and you'll see why. Um, as I was looking at material about this reburial effort in the National Archives, I found a diary that didn't have a name on it, but it was about a journey by a, someone who'd served as a quartermaster during the war with a detail of troops through the western part of the South to try to identify bodies and um, figure out how to find areas for national cemeteries and to rebury them. He ended up ultimately uh, um, finding about 100,000 of that 300,000 total. These stories are extraordinary, and one of the aspects of his discovery was that so often African-American communities had sheltered the Union dead, tried to maintain identities, maintain graveyards until these Union troops came in after the war and created the national cemeteries. But as I read more in this unidentified diary, I pieced some things together and figured out that the person who was writing it was named Edmund Whitman. And I got quite interested in him. He was an older man. He was in his 50s at the time of the Civil War. He'd been a quartermaster. And as I traced him backwards, I found that he had come from Kansas, where he had gone as part of the John Brown effort to keep Kansas free in the years before the Civil War. Then I traced him back a little further and found that he'd come to Kansas from Massachusetts, where he had been tied up with um, connected to all the abolitionists around Concord and connected to a number of prominent abolitionist figures in uh, Massachusetts. And then guess what I found? Graduated from Harvard in 1838. So <laughs> it all comes back to Harvard. So <laughs> And truly, that was the, the end of my discovery about him. I didn't begin with Harvard. I ended with Harvard. So we should I see mean, if there are so, questions. I was really so <laughs> struck by it because his discoveries were, were so moving and played such a central role. Um, any questions for, for Dr. Faust? Or? Also for Rick. Yeah, right there. an education newspaper in New York City. And um, um, I was thinking about the words of Robert Burns as you were speaking, that man's inhumanity to man has caused countless grief uh, in our society. And you know, it's still going on. I wondered if you had any words to share about how do we stop that? 
Well, you know, Drew, y y you said something in the course of our work together about some of the questions that had come up in the aftermath of the publication of this Republic of Suffering, <clears throat> which questioned whether or not it was, you know, that you were, and it was an argument against the Civil War, against the consequences of what had happened. And tell what did that make you think? Some um, critics of the book said I was, it was written as if I thought the Civil War never should have happened. And that was not at all my intent. It wasn't even a question that occurred to me. I don't think historians should prescribe what should happen in the past, so it seemed bewildering to me. I think our job is more to explain it. But what I really wanted this book to do was to say, war costs a lot, and we should know that. We shouldn't hide from it in a sense of uh, focus on the glory and the trumpets and the drums and the um, heroism. That's not the essence of war. The essence of war is this. And we will decide as societies, as nations, at different times that wars have to be fought but we should know that this is what we're deciding for. And I found that this book has been of great interest to people in the military, assigned, I'm gonna do a whole day about it at West Point next month, for example, and students are being assigned the book, because they know that this is what war costs, and they're very glad to have other people in society confronted with it because they pay this cost. And so I think that's part an answer, part of an answer to you, which is historians at least have a role to play in answering your question by telling the truth as it really is and not permitting the kind of delusions that our society so often engages in in order to make it more possible to do very difficult and costly and, and awful things. Yes, sir. You speak of delusions, yet currently we have a political debate where a great many candidates are speaking in terms of we will do this, we will do that, relating to the military, relating to conflict, without any apparent recognition of the, co of the material human cost involved. How do you balance those scales? What can you say to, I guess, us to get, to help us understand why they're saying that? What can you say to them that would get them to be more articulate in terms of expressing what the hell they're trying to talk about? Um, I wish I had an answer to our current political dilemmas. Um, <laughs> I do believe that for many people at least, reason and argument can have an effect. And so I think portraying reality and pushing back at these bold statements with implications of what those statements contain is an important thing to do. But I certainly can't solve um, with, with a film like this or a book like mine these enormously um, difficult political dilemmas. I guess one of the aspects of this I'd think about, and I thought about actually when I was finishing the book, was I was very struck that as Obama had to decide at the very beginning of his term whether he was going to um, support further and enhanced activity in the Middle East, whether he was going to withdraw the troops. He went to Dover Air Force Base and watched the coffins come in. And I was so moved by that because it seemed to me entirely consistent with what I just argued. This book is about watching the coffins come in. And that Obama felt that before he could make a dispassionate political presidential judgment, he also should, in a powerful way, remind himself of what that judgment might mean. So how can we make that a part of politics and make um, the confrontation of the consequences tied up with the arrival at a decision? Of which, very briefly, I mean, the stark contrast between the experience in America during the Civil War and the experience in America during our contemporary wars, um, you know, couldn't be greater. The, the, the 
arguably the Civil War is a period in American history where never before and never since has the civilian and the military population of the country been so integrated. So that you really had everybody, everybody was involved. There was, everybody had a stake in it. Everybody knew what was going on. The idea that a private commercial photographic outfit from New York City, um, Matthew Brady, could let his t have his team just wander onto the aftermath of the battleground at Antietam without having to be stopped by any military policy or procedure and to wander around on their own, indeed posing the bodies, taking the pictures, and then two months later down at Brady's Daguerrean uh, Museum on Lower Broadway, about a mile from here, show the dead of Antietam, as he called it. Um, so that people who, by that time, this is before Gettysburg, had had no experience in the north of what that carnage was going to be like. So that even people who were somewhat phys geographically remote from the war in America, in the Civil War, it was brought, as the New York Times put it, it was like having the dead bodies placed on your doorstep or in your backyard. Fast forward to now, and in a situation in which only 1% of the American population is involved in the military. That means 99% of us, uh, certainly includes myself, have nothing to do with the military. And there's certainly, imagine an exhibition on Lower Broadway or anywhere else called The Dead of Fallujah, in which a private commercial outfit of videographers had gone in, taken a movie, and then invited people to come in and see it. It's absolutely inconceivable. So it seems to me what Drew's work points the necessity for is to absolutely reduce as much as possible the gap in awareness and understanding that the civilian population has about what war is really about. Doesn't mean that you necessarily want the war to continue or not to continue. It has no policy prescription involved in it. But if you close that gap, then at least some people will go, as for example Lincoln did, by those open graves at Gettysburg. The war is going to go on. He did not, one of the greatest political figures in American life, did not say, we have to end this. He said, we have to make sure we win this, and went on and committed another 350,000 deaths um, in the aftermath of it. So you might not make the decision not to continue war when the bodies are right in front of you, but you have to have the bodies right in front of you. Um, yes, right here in the second row. With the sweeping devastation of the war, I was curious about changes to family life and family dynamics after the war and into the later part of the 19th century. That's a great question, really and great there's question. Um, been considerable interesting research about it, and I'm sure there's research going on now that I'm not aware of because I have a different day job. Um, <laughs> One of the aspects that one sees in the South is, and I, I wrote about this actually in an earlier book, women who either are confronted by husbands who are so mentally incapacitated or emotionally incapacitated, even if not physically incapacitated, that women find themselves forced to continue with responsibilities that they may have thought would end at the end of the war. So I think there's a real shift in power dynamics within families, and women are not necessarily enthusiastic about this. They sort of thought, well, he'll come back and then I stop have to, having to have all these responsibilities all the time. But often, the man came back and those responsibilities remain to a significant extent in um, the hands of, of white women in the South. So that was one of the dynamics. Obviously, in the South also, with the end of slavery, the distribution of labor in families, of wealth, all of that was, was very corrosive of traditional um, uh, patterns of, of family life. So that, that was significant as, uh, in the same way. And then, you know, with a lot of deaths and a lot of children and um, families that had missing members, it was throughout the nation something that, that really affected that late 19th century culture that, that I was talking about before. Yes. Oops, sorry. We have one question all the way in the back, and sure. then we'll come back. Mr. Burns, I wanted to thank you, and I'm sure James Cromwell would thank you for mentioning the horses. Millions of horses and pigeons and dogs have died involuntarily in our wars. My question is, we have 24 veterans a day that are killing themselves, 24 a day. You go down to Section 60 at Arlington National, 
the backhoes are still going. I can assure you of that. Mr. Bush and Mr. Obama has sent, despite Dover, have sent more and more troops to be killed. Has anything changed in the way we treat veterans, in the way we honor our veterans? Rick has just done a film called Debt of Honor, so that's a great question for him about veterans. You know, I, it's, it's remarkable or, or not that you bring that up because, you know, first of all, it's a good gig when you can work with the president of Harvard during your own day job. And so I was casting about after we finished the film to think of other ways Drew and I could collaborate. And we both had the same instinct, which was to, in some way, try to work on a project which would help close the gap between the civilian and the military populations and his ideas that have that still continue to resonate for both of us um, and I bring it up because I think that that the the, the way in which the veterans experience um, after their service kind of disappears back into the civilian population in America now is really a hideous shame. I mean, it's the fact that the, the biggest gap when you have 1% of the population only involved in military service is that just most of us don't, we obviously we're not serving on the battlefield, but we don't have relatives, brothers, sisters, fathers, um, mothers who are serving and therefore are not in direct daily contact with that experience. And so, it, again, as with the Civil War, which was not o over when Appomattox occurred, so all our wars are continuing with this flood of veterans coming home um, with PTSD, with you know, ev um, amputations, with grievous internal, visible and invisible wounds. Um, and we do not have a sufficiently organized body politic sufficiently aware of that circumstance to be able to understand what an urgent political human necessity it is. So it becomes this kind of abstract uh, political football in which the, the VA is criticized for um, not being able to fulfill the, its mandate. Um, so I think that one of the most important moral issues facing the country today is the question of how are we going to respond to the needs of the men and women who make every kind of sacrifice, including the last full measure of devotion, as Lincoln put it. And the only way I can imagine an answer that's meaningful to your question, we're not going to be able to really do much as much as we should to help veterans returning now. But I think that if we moved as a country towards some sort of sense that there has to be some universal compulsory national service, maybe not military, which is a political dead end and a non-starter will never happen, but some kind of two-year experience that involved every American boy and girl between the ages of 18 and 24 with some kind of service you know, Conservation Corps, Urban Corps, Teach for America, or indeed if they chose to go into the military. So they knew what it was to make that kind of sacrifice, and even if it was only 1% of the population that was involved in the military itself, there would still be some way of scaling what it meant to serve something larger. I think in that kind of circumstance, it might not be so hard to find the political will to take care of people who come back having left some part of themselves visible or invisible on a battlefield on the other side of the world. Good. Yes, sir, in the back. One more. One more? Yeah. Yes, sir. You spoke a little about um, Matthew Brady and the photography exhibitions that had uh, an immediate impact on the North in the population, given that I don't think there was anybody of, of comparable stature doing the same thing in the South. Did the lack of that photographic evidence uh, to the population in the South, did that have an impact on how the war progressed, uh, and I guess politically and both militarily? Boy, Drew, the statistics of the number of families, I mean, what is it, three in five white men of Confeder in the Confederacy were involved in the war? So you didn't need a photograph when it was almost a foregone conclusion that some member of your family was actually involved in the action. The much larger northern population didn't have anywhere near that number, that statistic of involvement. But Drew, would you say that I somehow don't feel that the absence or the relative absence of commercial photography um, kept the South from understanding how entirely engaged the war was happening on their, in their backyard 
in their alleys, across their meadows and farmlands, mm -hmm. from Virginia to Mississippi and back again. And J.R. Montgomery died in Virginia, though he was a Mississippian. Right. The level of mobilization of the White South was extraordinary. Three out of four mil men of military age served, uh, and about 20% of them died. So people were very close in that sense. But your question is such an interesting one, because it's kind of about media. What, and I've thought a lot about media. How did people know things? The South was so economically pressed that there were real shortages of paper, of ink, so papers stopped publishing as often, the mails didn't work. So how were people getting information? Not simply about, did my loved one die, but what went on in Gettysburg? What went on somewhere else? Just one statistic um, that I think is illustrative. The Battle of the Wilderness, which had an enormous death toll in the spring of 1864, the very first highly inaccurate casualty lists were published in South Carolina papers, first lists, 10 days after the battle. So then you ask, okay, who read, who got access to those papers, and was it word of mouth? How did people know things? I think your question is a very good one. They, people were engaged in the war because of this high level of mobilization, but the kind of imagery or news they had about the war was far more limited than in the North because of its industrial superiority and greater economic strength. So I think that was our last question, yes? I'm afraid it was. Uh... Thank you so much. We're so glad to have you. Thanks.